Hello, my name's Chris Pardica. Welcome to part one of a two-part lecture series where we'll be discussing an interesting but challenging group of patients with advanced cardiac failure. These patients have typically reached the end of conventional treatment algorithms and have become heavily, if not fully dependent upon their mechanical support devices. You may say that they are part person and part machine. I have no doubt that each of you are capable of identifying this rhythm as ventricular fibrillation. But what if I told you that this ECG was taken from a patient sitting up in their hospital bed talking on their mobile phone? It is a well-known fact that patients with implanted ventricular assist devices tolerate ventricular dysrhythmias incredibly well. In fact, there are several case reports of conscious VF documented throughout medical literature. This lecture will focus on the basics of ventricular assist devices, or VADs, focusing on their basic components as well as their function. We will also discuss the physiological implications post VAD insertion, as well as an approach to assessing these complicated patients. To date, my clinical exposure to patients with implanted ventricular cyst devices is limited to just four. There was a patient in full cardiorespiratory arrest, a female patient with torrential PV bleeding and hemorrhagic shock, a young man with presyncopal or orthostatic symptoms, and then there was this guy. <laughs> Shut your trap. The truth be told, it wasn't really this man, but a mere look-alike who was on the dance floor at a wedding two and a half hour drive away from their metropolitan tertiary cardiac transplant and VAD center. Being at this wedding reminded me that these patients with ventricular assist devices could be anywhere within the state or within the country and not always near the centers that they require for their expertise. So we'll now delve into the basics of these ventricular assist devices. Here we see a modern generation VAD. These have been successfully implanted for the past three decades, and they result in a marked improvement in one year survival and quality of life for patients with severe cardiac failure that is refractory to aggressive medical management. Here is a schematic of a modern ventricular assist device implanted into the heart. The original first generation VADs were pulsatile flow devices. They were aimed to emit a waveform in, in the circulation intended to mimic systole and diastole of native circulation and were driven by an electric motor with a pusher plate. Newer generation VADs are centrifugal or rotary continuous flow devices. With these newer devices, carries improved survival, fewer device malfunctions, and a, and a lower risk of embolic stroke. Whilst these devices are typically implanted into the left ventricle and known as LVADs, under the appropriate clinical circumstances, they can be placed in the right ventricle, known as an RVAD, or within both ventricles, known as a BIVAD, which is different to a total artificial heart. VADs typically comprise of an inflow cannula, which is surgically implanted within the apex of the left ventricle. There's the pump itself with the, their associated mechanical and electrical components and an outflow conduit that is again surgically anastomosed to the ascending aorta. There's an associated percutaneous lead known as the drive line and external system components that the patient typically carries around their waist known as a controller with monitoring and power source with battery components. <laughs> 
Here we have schematics of the two most commonly implanted VADs in Australia, the Thoratec Heartmate 2 and the Heart Heartware HVAD. Both of these are continuous, non-pulsatile flow devices. Within these two schematics, you can identify the impeller, or the only moving part within a VAD. The impeller rotates within a frictionless environment as a result of current applied to magnets within the LVAD pump. The impeller is actually magnetically levitated within this device and is capable of rotating at 3000 RPM and capable of generating blood flow of up to 10 litres per minute. In this schematic, we can see how the LVAD functions. By creating negative pressure within the pump, it assists by drawing blood out of the apex of the left ventricle through the impeller itself, which propels blood forward outside the, uh, out through the outflow conduit into the ascending aorta. In this slide, we're able to see a VAD and all its component trees implanted within the patient. The inflow cannula arises from the apex of the left ventricle with the pump itself placed within the thoracic cavity. The flexible gel impregnated outflow graft is anastomosed to the ascending aorta and the electrical componentry through the percutaneous drive line traverses through into the abdominal cavity and exits cutaneously in either the epigastrium or the right upper quadrant where it then connects with the controller on the patient's waist. The controller typically has two battery supplies at a minimum but is also capable of drawing from AC power. This is a picture of the Heartware HVAD controller. It gives the patient important information, particularly battery life, and also gives clinician information regarding flow rates, power usage, and RPM. The controllers frequently display alarm notifications, useful, useful for both patients, family members, and clinicians and it also collects constant information that can be downloaded at the VAD center for further analysis and VAD modification. Here is a typical chest x-ray of a patient with a Heartware HVAD. It goes without saying that these patients often have prolonged pre-existing cardiac dysfunction prior to the insertion of their VAD. Ventricular dysrhythmias and heart block are commonplace and as a result, these patients often have permanent pacemakers or internal defibrillators implanted as well. Let's now look at the indications for VAD implantation. There are three main indications. Firstly, a bridge to transplantation. Secondly, a bridge to recovery in patients with a recoverable myocardial illness such as postpartum cardiomyopathy or myocarditis, and destination therapy for patients who are deemed inappropriate for cardiac transplantation, but benefit from the physiological improvements from having a VAD. Whilst this is the most common indication currently in the United States, this is not used as a therapy in Australia at this point in time. The ventricular assist device aims to decompress a diseased, distended, hypokinetic left ventricle. The main goal of this is to reduce myocardial work and subsequent myocardial oxygen demand. But at the same time, the VAD must maintain adequate systemic perfusion and end organ function. The VAD does this by reducing left ventricular end diastolic pressure and subsequent left ventricular myocardial oxygen demand. By continuous flow through its outflow graft, the VAD also creates continuous aortic flow. The concept of pulselessness occurs frequently in discussions in patients with VADs. We'll discuss this further on the next slide. 
Other physiological implications following the implantation of a VAD is that of a change in physiology to the right ventricle. There's hematological implications, particularly with hemolysis and platelet function. There's immune and inflammatory modification, as well as changes to the neuroendocrine axis. Clinicians who have unexpectedly dealt with patients with implanted VADs often discuss the challenges associated with patient assessment, which is frequently a result of the concept of pulselessness. In continuous flow VADs, with increasing pump speed, there is an associated increase in diastolic blood pressure. Given the underlying poor cardiac contractility in these patients, there is rarely an improvement in systolic pressure and with higher pump speeds, there is a diminished pulse pressure in these patients. In fact, the average pulse pressure in patients with an LVAD is approximately 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury. Other influences on the ability to palpate a peripheral pulse in these patients depends on ongoing pump speed, native or persistent LV contractility and ejection fraction, as well as preload and afterload. We will now come back to the fourth patient in the list mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, and we'll start to have a think about in the well patient with the implanted ventricular assist device, how will we assess their well-being? The assessment of a patient with a ventricular assist device should initially be no different than any other patient assessment. Patient appearance and a primary survey is paramount. This should take into consideration their mental state, their skin perfusion and the presence or absence of signs of life. The VAD itself should then be assessed in a systematic way. Firstly, by auscultating over the precordium or the subcostal region. The presence of a constant burring or buzzing noise suggests inherent activity of the VAD pump itself. Next, all the connections should be assessed, starting with the percutaneous drive line and ensuring that that's appropriately connected to the controller and that subsequently the controller is connected to at least two battery supplies or to wall electricity. The controller should then be assessed for RPM, power usage and flow rates. The presence or absence of alarm notifications should also be noted. Recording standard observations in these patients is often challenging and a result of the concept of pulselessness, where automated blood pressure cuffs and pulse oximetry usually don't work. Careful hemodynamic assessment must then take place with the use of manual blood pressure cuffs, Doppler ultrasound, telemetry and 12 lead ECG, plus the clever use of limited bedside echo. As mentioned earlier, the inability to detect peripheral pulses has implications on the use of automated blood pressure cuffs. Recall that these patients don't have measurable systolic or diastolic blood pressures. What we're aiming to measure is that of a mean arterial pressure or a perfusion pressure in these patients. The standard map for patients with VADs is between 70 to 90 millimeters of mercury, but it is worth asking each patient on an individual level what's normal for them. Blood pressure can then be measured manually or invasively. Manual blood pressure measurement can take place in a similar setup to what's seen in the image in this slide. Here, a handheld Doppler is placed over the brachial or radial artery while a manual blood pressure cuff is gradually reduced of pressure. The Doppler is listened to 
until there is a constant continuous humming noise. This is consistent with the mean arterial pressure. An alternate way of measuring non-invasive mean arterial pressure in these patients is with bedside ultrasound and the use of a Doppler gate over the radial or brachial artery in a similar manner with a manual blood pressure cuff gradually reducing the pressure until a constant waveform is noted. In this patient, there is assumed to be some form of native left ventricular function, as is evidence on this waveform of some systolic flow. As cuff pressure is gradually reduced, you can see the mean arterial or perfusion pressure making its way through this waveform. And in this final slide, this constant waveform is consistent with the mean arterial or perfusion pressure. Finally, limited echocardiography can assist the clinician in the hemodynamic assessment of a patient with an implanted VAD. In this parasternal long axis, we can note a diffusely hypokinetic distended left ventricular chamber. The anterior mitral leaflet has minimal mobility and there is a hyperechoic structure arising from the apex of the left ventricle. This is the inflow cannula of the VAD. In an unstable patient with a ventricular assist device, similarly to what will be discussed in the second lecture of this series, bedside echocardiography can be utilised in the diagnostics and therapeutics of this patient, particularly noting chamber sizes. For example, a distended right ventricle and left ventricle suggest left ventricular outflow obstruction, which may take place with a VAD thrombus. Large right ventricle with a collapsed left ventricle may suggest a new RV infarction or worsening pulmonary hypertension. And a small right ventricle with a collapsing inferior vena cava may suggest failing preload such as hemorrhage or hypovolemia. This brings us to the end of part one on the basics of ventricular assist devices. We have discussed the basic VAD physiology, the standard components of the assist devices, and the basics of the patient assessment. In part two, we will discuss the common crises that can occur in these patients. See you next time.